post that first. Justin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Representative Bert McCormick. I'm the chair of the Transportation Committee. And I have about um, five weeks of seniority in that position. And my counterpart in the Senate has about 55 years. <laughs> so I'm going to ask him to run this hearing. Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for coming. We appreciate you. It's a beautiful day we picked for you. So you can travel. You don't have to salt your road with your plow or anything else. Good crowd here today. So what we'd like to do, we have a sign-up sheet. If anybody else wants to add to it, uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll go around the table and introduce ourselves from what district we're from. <coughs> and then we want to hear your concerns. And uh, I know you're here to tell us we're doing a wonderful job. You don't need anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> Does that sound right? Okay, from there we'll... Uh, We'll start off, Dick Mazza, Chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, and we'll uh, start over here. Jim McNeil of Rutland County. Andrew Perkselik, Washington County. Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax. Uh, Tim Corkin, I represent Bennington. Molly Barth, Representative from Brattleboro. Mike McCarthy from St. Albans. Dave Potter, representing Clarendon, West Rutland, Proctor, Wallingford, and Alulotin. <laughs> Patty McCoy, representing Pulteney and Ira. I'm Quigley, I live in Concord, I represent eight towns in the Essex County District. Brian Savage, I live in Swanton, but I represent Swanton and Sheldon. Uh, Rebecca White, and I represent Hartford. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're all set. I think the first one, if you can help me here, we can make sure we get the name correct. Chris, Chris Beans? Yep. From Waterbury. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Well, I came here a little early to make sure I got on the list, but I certainly didn't want to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm the current chair of the select board in the town of Waterbury. Um, I kind of go through a, I got a list here of uh, points. Your picture was in the paper yesterday, wasn't it? Was that yours? That was, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're in trouble already. He discontent here. <laughs> So I'll just give you a brief background here of, of uh, myself. Um, the excavation uh, business has been in my family way back to my grandfather who uh, uh, started his business, number one, working for the town of Faston uh, prior to 1938. Uh, my Uncle Fred and my dad both uh, carried on with that uh, business. My dad worked on the interstate for a number of years. He was a drill rig runner, dr drilling for blasting. And uh, I've been in the construction industry since uh, I was 21. I'm 59 now, so I'll be 38 years plus. And my son um, has been running an excavator since he was 10 years old, and he's in his mid-30s. So there's a little bit of background there. Um, I've been on the board for going on seven years. Uh, one of the reasons I got on the uh, select board was uh, the desire to help improve our infrastructure. I could see it deteriorating at a rapid rate. Um, four years ago, I uh, did a little presentation in front of the townspeople at town meeting, cost analysis on the amount of just the paved roads issues that we had. Um, it's been a long-standing effort with uh, the previous boards to try to put in $300,000 or somewhere in that range uh, in the paving CIP. Uh, there were years that that fell short. Um, but due to my presentation, uh, the result of the information that I put forward suggested that we need closer to $1.4 million in order to keep up with a uh, life expectancy of about seven years for paved roads in the state of Vermont. So you can see there's quite a disparity there. Um, last year was the first year that we were actually able to uh, double that, 300,000 to 600,000. Um, we actually had the ability to improve, improve a lot of the smaller sections of roads in hopes to kind of put those to bed for a while and enable us to attack some of the bigger road problems. Um, uh, I attempted to walk this path three years ago with a gas tax, a proposal for a gas tax. Um, early on, I realized that it seemed as though the uh, 
legislative body didn't have the stomach for it, so I kind of dropped the ball. Um, it had been an issue right along in the, in the last few years that, uh, you know, I've been on the board. Waterbury had accomplished some, some major issues over the last few years after the flood and recovering ourselves. Um, at one point here just recently, so we've taken care of a lot of our major problems in the town of Waterbury. Uh, as far as our municipal building, our fire station upgrades, and some other significant issues. Uh, so now it's time to focus on the bigger problem, which is our infrastructure. Um, Mr. Freitag uh, from Stratford had put an article in the paper suggesting that there may be some small items that the legislative body here at the State House could consider doing that would be relatively easy solutions. Uh, and one of them was considering the possible gas tax to help with roads and infrastructure. Well, that re-energized my efforts. I immediately got on the phone to him. And uh, with the help from him and uh, Kerry Dolan and BLCT, here I am. Um, I'm the last person to want to come up here and ask for taxes or any form of revenue. Uh, I know it's a touchy subject, but the problem that I'm trying to address is not going away. In fact, it's got to the point where it's uh, becoming, becoming exponential. Um, there's many reasons that cause the destruction of our bad roads. The number one problem is a poor subface on a lot of the roads and the frost that accompanies that. There's three things that create heaving in roads, poor soils, water content, and cold temperatures. If you can eliminate <coughs> any one of those three items, you've eliminated the frost problem. Uh, from what I understand from a very reliable source, our asphalt quality today has become uh, poorer because of the refining process, has taken a lot of the goodness out of the asphalt, which makes it more susceptible to early destruction. Um, and that's, you know, that comes from the gas companies and how they are refining. People are reluctant to slow down. That's another damaging aspect. To the road systems and excessive salt use contributes highly to you know creating that water that sits in the roads and the vehicles continue to pound it. This winter is a great example of the amount of salt use and plowing and you know ongoing destruction to the road systems uh, that, that we've seen in quite some time. So through talking with our town, the Waterbury town manager, John Freitag, and a few other people just kind of bumping heads on this gas tax issue, we, we came up with uh, the idea of suggesting a four cent tax. Is four cents going to be enough to solve this problem? <laughs> Most certainly not. But I know we're sensitive to any additional taxes in this state. You know, 40 cents require to be closer to help it solve this solution, this problem. The problem is you've got to try to create a revenue source that can somehow get ahead of the deterioration rate. Because if you don't have the revenues to do that, you're just going to continue to fall behind. There's been some uh, uh, you know, calculations on what the four cents might possibly generate. And it seems like it'd be somewhere around 10 million to 13 million a year, somewhere in that range. Uh, the request from us would be to, if it's possible, I know that money is typically goes into the general fund, from what I understand. I'd hate to see any of it diverted to other revenue or other avenues, uh, simply because of the the issue that we're trying to address is so dire that any additional money uh, is needed. 
And all I'm asking is that we have the ability to bring our infrastructure back to a manageable state. And I had one select board member, previous select board member, say to me, you know, Chris, I was part of the problem of not pushing to try to get more revenues into the infrastructure uh, CIP. And that's this, you know, this problem didn't just occur yesterday. It's been building for a number of years. Um, and then I find out that the governor is interested in, in cutting some of that revenue source out of the agency of transportation. I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it was perhaps maybe some federal funding that was initially given to the states to try to deal with stormwater and whatnot. Um, that seems to have dried up. So I guess the money is getting pulled out of that the agency of transportation. You know, the governor has suggested paying people to try to move to Vermont. I won't call it a bribe, but it's, it seems to be uh, we're desperate to try to get more people to move into the state, but quite frankly, who wants to move in into a house that's falling down around you? Our infrastructure, uh, you know, not only the, the cost of trying to deal with this problem, not only impacts our budget, the town budget. I mean, our town budget for just November, December was $20,000 over the salt budget. Uh, we're using more salt because the roads are so bad. We're using more salt because the snow just can't get cleaned off. So more salt has to be used in order to melt the snow that's in them low spots and in them wheel tracks. And so we're damaging the town's vehicles and also people's vehicles. And the impact of the environment, to me, is getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, at one of the board meetings, I brought, as part of the agenda, a discussion about salt and sand use. And my suggestion was, if you don't think salt is causing any issues with the water problems, next time you go to drink a glass of water, let me pour some rock salt in it first. Take a drink of it and see how you like it. You know, it's impacting the wildlife, it's impacting the microorganisms in our brooks and streams. We don't have fish in the brooks anymore like we used to have. Invasive species, you look along the roadsides and the riverbanks, are having a field day because the soils are being toxified with the amount of salt that's being dumped on the roads and all the other stuff that runs into the brooks and streams. Uh, no other native species can grow in that type of acidic soil, but invasive species sure can. And those salt residuals, just because winter's over and the roads are all dried up and you know, the snow's all gone away, the salt residuals continue to run into the water all year long because they're in that soil saturated in the soil along the, along the, along the roadsides and the riverbanks. I don't, I don't want to slow down with sure. the 17 counters. We, we want to make sure yeah. that we the opportunity. Yeah, so if we can improve these better roads, you know, it kind of reverses all of what I'm talking about. We can't keep kicking the can because the longer we kick the can, the worse the problem is. Uh, we could attach more cost to the property tax, but we're about maxed out. And, uh, you know, it's either property tax or gas tax. Pick your poison, whichever one you're interested in. And like Judge Judy says, if you eat the state, you gotta pay for it. So people coming in from out of state, you know, big trucks that have heavy impacts on the roads, all those things go into you know, deterioration of our roads, and we seriously got to consider trying to do something to uh, reverse this problem. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, David Bronson, Bridgeport. Bridgeport, Town Bridgeport, and the select 
board uh, adopted this. Um, the town credit board uh, is against the governor's proposed fiscal year 2020 transportation budget increase. So Could you pull the mic closer to you, please? <clears throat> this is close enough. Yeah. <clears throat> the town, I'm sorry. The town credit board is against the governor's proposed fiscal year 2020 transportation budget decrease of 6.6 .6 million, about 9.5 percent, in funding for combined town highway programs. <clears throat> Yet the state has recently increased uh, the burden of towns um, with new highway requirements under the municipal road general permit. Uh, report's budget is based on continuing to receive at least about the same in state aid for class two and highways. The <coughs> report is a small rural town, about 1,200 people, uh, has bridges and large culverts need to be replaced at substantial cost. <coughs> For example, the town is in the process of replacing a large metal culvert with a proposed 20-foot uh, wide, 9-foot high, 43-foot long precast concrete box culvert, uh, one estimated cost of which is $500,000. Um, this cost includes needing to meet <clears throat> state, federal, uh, and or federal requirements, such as for hydraulic analysis um, and environmental analysis, and includes substantial engineering costs. Uh, general state aid Town highways uh, should increase at least as provided for in Title 19, BSA subsection 306A, on general state aid to highway, town highways. Uh, given the financial hardship uh, for towns like Bridport to try to fund the great expense of replacing bridges and large culverts, uh, the, the state should substantially increase both the usual $175,000 grant limit and the total amount of grant money available to towns for such projects. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. John Friday, director. Yes, points. Senator Masha. Representative McCormick, members of the House and Senate Transportation Committees, thank you so much for allowing town officials to testify before this joint session of the Transportation Committees. Vermont, as you know, is a Dillon Rule state in which the power and the authority of the towns derive from what is given by the legislature. We who serve on our local boards do our best for our communities with what responsibility and resources you provide. We are your boots on the ground. The main responsibility of select boards has always been the maintenance of our community's transportation infrastructure. For many communities like my own, this represents over two-thirds of our budget. The governor's transportation budget recognizes the cost of maintaining our state highways and interstates and has dramatically increased and his budget includes a $6 million expenditure in this regards. It's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, the governor's budget neglects the fact that 70% of the roads in Vermont are maintained by cities and towns. At a time of climate change, bringing wild swings of weather, far more ice storms, and often multiple mud seasons, the governor's budget, rather than Recognizing that local roads need the same increase as the state maintained highways, his proposal cuts the amount for the combined highway program by 6.6 .6 million, leaving towns to rely even more heavily on property taxes to, fur to further to defer, to defer needed upgrades. We're here to seek redress. We urge you to acknowledge the poor conditions of many of our community's roads and the towns need to help address their needs. We ask that at a minimum, you restore the amount provided in this year's budget and increase it by at least 2.8% to cover the cost of inflation. Further, we ask you to consider providing additional funds to local communities 
to allow us to address the many pressing infrastructure needs faced in maintaining over 13,000 miles of town maintained roads. My own community of Stratford, with a population of around 1,400, is a good example of the challenges we face. Stratford has 67 miles of highways, over 40 bridges to maintain. We have no state-maintained highways in our community, and we rely heavily on paving and bridge grants and what is given, what is currently given from the gas tax to help meet our needs. Unable to keep up with the cost of maintaining our paved roads, we have begun to grind them up and, and, and we have rebuilt over seven miles of paved roads and turned them back into gravel. A nearly $1 million bond was taken out in 2012 to do the majority of this work. And at this point, we are still falling behind in maintaining the remaining 11 miles of paved roads in our town. We desperately need more, not less help in keeping up the end of this, in, in our end of the state's transportation system. Currently, the greatest amount of funds collected by the state gas tax, 12.1 cent, per gallon goes into the general fund, not maintaining our highways. A 4% tax on the price per gallon goes into maintaining our highway infrastructure, while another 2% fund transportation improvements. A final one cent per gallon goes to fund the cleanup of gasoline spills. Please, in your wisdom, consider adjusting either the current distribution so that more of the gas tax goes instead of to the general fund for its local infrastructure highway needs, or if it is feasible from a legislative transpoint to add an increase to the gas tax that would go directly back to towns using the current distribution formula. This is desperate we need. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to speak before the joint session regarding the most basic pressing needs for, for the people of our state. Left unattended, it will only get worse and the cost in the long run get higher. And finally, I'd, I'd like to say something nice about the State Transportation Department. They are incredibly helpful in working with the local towns. It is a partnership, and we need each other. And we're here for you. Give us the tools to do our job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Jeff King. Good morning. My name is Jeff King. I'm, as, as of now, the chairman of the Pulteney Select Board. And first off, I'd like to thank the Transportation Department. We do have one bridge. I do believe you know which one we'll be working on this summer. And we've gone through a lot of, a lot of prep work so that the project can be done. Pulteney, in the village of Pulteney, I also have replace the water lines down the, down the side and across Route 30. <clears throat> Route 30 is slated to be resurfaced next year. I have to ask you, is that still going to happen? Do you know? You know, everything's in our books, and uh, unless you heard differently, it, it is slated, if it's in the book, it's there. Thank you, because I've been I've been asked a lot if that is still going to happen because it's very difficult driving through the village of Pulteney and down Route 30. Our, our infrastructure, as everybody's saying, is, is falling line. So it's, it's falling. With the, we have a, another small problem other than Route 30, but with Green Mountain College announcing its closure this year, we're losing 150 jobs and 400 students. We are now actively trying to develop a plan to replace a business that we lost in Vermont. It is going to be extremely difficult to entice a new business to come into the state of Vermont with a highway system in the SUA on Route 30. So all of us down in the southern part of the state, down that area, are really hoping that the state will continue and just resurface Route 30 through the village of Pulteney, you know, from Route 4 all the way down. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Okay, Nick. Nick, Glover. because 
they got a 200, two 100 gallon saddle tanks that are going all the way to cover me, wrecking Route 14 and driving all the way back down, and they're not buying any tax here either. So I personally have absolutely no objection <coughs> to a four cent or a 10 cent or a 20 cent gas tax because six years ago I was paying four dollars a gallon. Now I'm paying 229. Exxon is still making six billion dollars a quarter. They aren't paying any taxes in the state of Vermont. So that small amount of gas tax, I think it's really nominal. And as others will testify and have testified, we need that money to rebuild our roads. We don't have it in the budget. And every year it's a discussion. It shouldn't even be a discussion. <clears throat> you can't own equipment without putting money aside. If you have a business, you don't buy a piece of equipment if you can't maintain it. Now, as a selectman, what, what were we supposed to do? We're still required <laughs> to maintain our third class roads for the travel of a standard pleasure car at all seasons of the year. That's a definition I will never forget. Pretty hard to do that when there's no money in the budget. When the gravel that, and the sand that we use for our roads was, when I was on the select board in the 2000s, it was $1.50 a yard. Uh, can you buy it? Roseanne today, anywhere in this state, for $1.50 a yard? And I can't even buy it. A lot of the places where we got it, we can't get it anymore because the Act 250 permit won't allow us to get it there. In a few years, we will not be able to get this material. At the same time, you're relying more and more on these very costly chemicals. I think we need to reverse the trend. I think it's in this committee's responsibility to do something about it. And I hope you will please try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mary Ann Blake, West Rock. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, I've been 10 years as a town manager in West Rock, and um, for the last six years I've been asking when uh, the state's going to be paving our class one roads. Um, it's been 21 years ago was the last time they were paved, and thank you, you're going to be paving them this, year, this summer. So thank you very much. Um, 21 years is a really long time, and, and towns are faced with how much do you um, maintain these roads and how much do you um, make them so they're drivable, so people don't complain, but we also don't want to fix them too much because the state will not pay them. So it's, it's very difficult for towns to um, wait and keep asking for six years. Um, we have 21 roads, miles of roads to take care of ourselves, and um, and that is a huge burden. And um, but we find a way to do it with the state's highway help. Um, anything more that you can give us um, with the gas tax would definitely be appreciated. We um, we have an industrial park with a lot of heavy trucks, and um, the road was was uh, very difficult for the for the businesses in that area. So we actually you know, took a bond out and fixed that road ourselves. Um, huge for a small town to take on something like that, but we knew it was our road. But we'll, when it's a class one road and there's nothing we can do about it, it's very difficult. So uh, so anyway, thank you for getting this on the list finally. Um, I just want a quick thing um, on the U.S. Route 4 bypass, um, mile marker 13. There's a, it's a twin bridges. Pretty much everyone knows it's a safety hazard. Um, there's uh, many accidents that happen on this area. It's a curve in the road. Um, the, um, there's a ledge nearby so the sun doesn't get on that road at all, so it's always very icy. Uh, we've been complaining and telling the state that something needs to be done. Our fire department responds to the many accidents um, and they put their lives in jeopardy because um, it's, you know, it's a 60 mile an hour highway and they're up there you know, responding to an accident. So um, that, that's been uh, very difficult for us. Uh, they addressed it last year by putting up um, some delineators, which are small, reflective. They turn blue when it's icy. And um, my, my, I had two teenage sons, and my, I was pointing them out to my sons to say, this is what they're supposed to be doing. This is supposed to alar alarm the average driver that it's, it's icy to slow down. And uh, they. They couldn't believe it. They're teenagers. Um, they're like, what? What blue? What blue sticker? They couldn't see it. So they're very small. They don't really 
tell the driver to be aware and to slow down and that the lower head is icy. So I, I do think that something needs to be done in that area. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a U.S. Route 4. The crash data is it's difficult because it's inaccurate on how, how the responders um, write in um, the, the data. Sometimes it's U.S. Route 4, sometimes it's Route 4, sometimes it's, it's just not consistent on how it's reported. So I think uh, the, the, the crash data does show there's, there is a problem there. Um, I think when the skiers are coming in to go to Killington, you know, they don't know, people locally know that there's an issue, but it's usually Friday nights when there's accidents. It's early in the morning when kids are going to Castleton to school, and again, I think it's something that the state needs to be aware of, and you know, we've been asking for years now, and nothing's really been done. I think a flashing light, perhaps, or something. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coming. Tad, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tad from News Ad from the town of Arabi. I'm trying to get the right guitar. <laughs> you know, Mr. Sir, you did just fine. You won't be the first, you won't be the last. I assure you. No, it's just fine. Um, start off on a good note. Your uh, district AOT divisions are fabulous. And that leads me to a rumor, and I think I heard it again today, that there might be some thought to consolidate uh, the districts. Makes sense. Here we are asking for additional funding. On your side, you may be looking to see how you may reduce certain expenses to reallocate, relocate, or allocate different funds. However, coming from a town as beautiful as Barry, our resources are limited, just as they are in many of the corridors of Route 5 and east to west from there on other roads. And that said, we rely, I ask to be very resourceful with the funds of limited tax dollars. From so having the amazing people from the AOP district just up in St. Jay, or when I was in Hartford, just right in town, if they were consolidated, I could be selfish and say, make sure it's in St. Jay. Might be easier. But nevertheless, the services needed would be that twofold of other service of the towns that need those services. When I say we resourceful, whether it's VLCT or your regional commission, we are a very amazing groups. And I put the AOD in right in that same group. Um, we don't have a highway part. We don't have a public work part. We have means to contract and services. So in essence, we rely heavily on it. Um, it may be a two-edged sword in respect of having to reduce expenses. Uh, but I remember last year being in the same room and we talked about the level of service that was of the expectation of every ERT employee. And I will tell you they exemplify what I would believe would be my expectations as a town administrator. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, Russell Hodgkin, West Minister. Uh, there are the West Minister this morning. Good? Great. Uh, <laughs> I'm Russell Hodgkin, town of Westminster. I'm the town manager and road commissioner. Um, I'd like to talk to you about Act 64 and what the burden that that's placed on us. We are a population of about 3,200 people. We have 88 miles of road, 53 of which are dirt. We just got our road inventory um, mappings, and we have hundreds of segments that need to be um, looked at. The aggregate in our area is, is deceased. It's, it's, um, it's hard to come by. We as a town have been proactive in changing even our, um, our inventory of equipment. We've gotten an excavator, we've gotten 10 wheelers versus the single axles, trying to get aggregate further away, and sand. But the stone is our biggest concern. Um, with a small road crew, um, this extra work is, is very much of a public concern. We still have to maintain public safety and, and, um, and do the maintenance of our regular work, plus added work from Act 64. 
We're very concerned about this. We've um, had two years to, to uh, attempt to get a handle on it, and we're not winning. The deadline is too, too close for us. Um, again, being active and proactive with our, um, our development, um, our small road crew of, of between five and six uh, employees isn't going to make it. Um, I would hope that you'd look at this, um, giving um, the towns a little more leeway and doing the best they can and not having a, a strict deadline of, of it has to be done by now. Um, as long as we're giving a great effort, I would hope that would be good enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Steve Baker, Kirby. I'm Steve Baker from the town of Kirby. It's a very small rural town in the Northeast Kingdom. And the reason I'm here is to address three issues. Your water quality control has become a very big problem uh, for us because of the requirement of stone line ditching um, and stormwater runoff from phosphorus, which we now only have two farms left. <coughs> I think the biggest problem the state observing because we have 26 miles of dirt road and a very little small section of paper, which is pretty too. When I travel to other towns such as Lindenville, St. Johnsbury, the excessive use of road salt is off the scale. They're salting and salting and salting. I think the AOT uses too much also, but less than the towns. At $109 a ton, this becomes an issue of instant gratification versus highway safety. Bare roads don't matter. Safe roads matter. In a conjunction with that, I'd like to say that perhaps the state could look into something that all the legal states should look for. Mandatory snow tires. We mandate everything. I'm not a mandate person, but it is what it is. But riding around with what I call all states with slide arounds is absurd. It's just absurd out of control. Accident after accident is caused by the slush. You can't steer, you can't stop, you can't start up, you spin. This is why accidents happen other than the obvious factors of speed and alcohol. Uh, I see no reason why this can't happen. I've heard people say they can't afford to buy snow tires. It's not true. They've got money for beer, cigarettes, pizza, and they don't. They got money for snow tires. It's just not a priority. I think at this stage of the game, when you look at roads like Route 15, between Morrisville and uh, Hardwick, the road is split lengthwise. The salt goes down, thaws the ground up, heaves the road. And it's a, a vicious circle. It just keeps going on and on. The concrete-based roads like Route 5, it goes down through the cracks, eats up the concrete, heaves the road. This is ridiculous. It's completely out of control, the amount of salt that's being used at $109 a ton. Sand is about six, seven dollars. Ten times the traction, one-tenth of the problems. I know there's issues with certain towns in stormwater runoff in the drains. They don't want sand. Most of those towns have a vac truck that can clean them out. Very small issue in the big picture. But just to keep dumping salt and dumping salt and dumping salt, it's so absurd, and this is a, in the brine. It's a, it's especially true in places like 89, Route 2. It just it just ends. You plow it, scrape it, sand it with snow tires. I have no problem whatsoever. Nobody else should either. And as far as the stormwater runoff, you can see what it's doing in streams and rivers. New York State has already had a huge amount of problems with road salt as a result of it. It's just, it's got to come to a head. It just, <coughs> people are going to have to bite the bullet. They're going to have to slow down by snow tires. It, it's just one of those things. It's, it's too many people per square mile in certain areas have created more and more accidents because they won't leave 10 minutes earlier. I think part of the problem could be resolved, resolved by less salt, more sand, and mandatory snow tires. Which more Thank people could hear your message because we get criticized for not bringing us to I know, I know you. I know you. I really do know that. But bear in mind, I know. my observation, and I drive a big truck I, I, over the road, I know exactly what goes on. Yeah. No, it, you can't steer, you can't stop. It doesn't work. It's a fantasy. Yeah, you can a little common sense. 
That's correct. And I, I believe that uh, instant gratification is the driving force to get out of staters to go to ski areas or whatever, whatever. And we could have perhaps a sign in the 91 room too. Snow tires required. You can't force it, it's not a law. But it could be a law for residents. They do it in Canada and it works. I uh, see no reason why this couldn't happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming over. Jeff Wimper, problem. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jeff Lindberg, Commissioner of Public Works for the City of Rutland, and I've worn multiple hats over the years, which uh, at least the chairs of the committee are well aware of, and several other members. Um, I would also like to add my words of thanks and, and praise to the Agency of Transportation. I'm going to have some complaints coming up, but I want to start. I want to, I, you can end it right here. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I need to start with this. Uh, we have had uh, multiple major bridge replacements, and I thank this committee and the legislature, but also the agency. have done some uh, marvelous work in our city for uh, you know, long-standing infrastructure problems that uh, have been and are being addressed in our transportation infrastructure. And there's absolutely no way that we could um, undertake those things uh, with local resources on our own. So, um, and the quality of the work that they've done, you know, there's little issues here and there, but all in all, the quality of the work that's been done uh, by the agency and by the contractors has been exemplary. So, I, I want to start by uh, recognizing that. I also want to recognize um, and give you a specific example of an area where the agency is uh, is, is making difficult decisions uh, relative to the limited resources they have available to them, and those decisions um, have uh, a direct impact on uh, on uh, property taxes and, and local infrastructure. In particular, it has already been mentioned the Class One roads. Uh, Class One roads are basically state highways, or U.S. highways that travel through cities or incorporated villages, and there is a program um, to uh, pay. Uh, Class one roads with a relatively small, I think it's a 10 or 20 percent um, local share. Um, that's an excellent program, but over the years, the amount of money available and the demand for those dollars have gone somewhat in opposite directions, and as a result, the schedule, uh, the, the cycle for uh, the class one roads paving program is now 15 years. These roads um, are some of the most heavily traveled. They're in urban centers. They take some of the heaviest uh, truck traffic. Um, there's a lot of stop because these are in villages and cities. They tend to take quite a bit of stop and go traffic. And anybody who's ever traveled through the city of Rutland knows a little bit about our traffic lights on Route 7. And as a result, there's a lot of stop and go there. More stop and go sometimes. Um, but that has an effect on the on the pavement. And so. Uh, we've had to spend significant sums of money, large percentage of our limited local budget, in order to patch Class 1 roads together to try to get to that 15-year cycle. Um, I understand the reason why the agency is doing that and the limitations they're working with and anything that you can do to help them so that they can do perhaps uh, a, a more appropriate job uh, of helping us. Seven to ten years is the most you can ever expect to get out of even a first class project on one of those roads. 10 years is really stretching it. Um, but 15 years um, just is, is, is never going to work. The only other thing I'd like to speak to, and this is mostly just as a heads up, uh, and this is going to sound right out of left field because most of you probably never heard this before. Um, the city of Rowan has attempted for the last two years um, diligently to negotiate with the Agency of Transportation and also Vermont Railway, who um, own and lease and operate uh, the rail system within the city. And there are 24 crossings uh, within the city and the town of Rutland where railroads cross our streets. In fact, the rail yard is principally within the city. All the rail uh, crossings and everything in the city are essentially within rail yard itself, so there's a lot of activity there. Um, we have uh, 
<laughs> water and wastewater infrastructure that needs to travel, currently does, um, underneath these crossings. Historically, it's been there for 100 years plus. And a recent project that uh, we are nearing completion of at this point um, to solve a very important public safety and health um, challenge uh, in part of our community has been held up by the requirement that the agency and the railroad have placed on us and are placing on every other municipality where this comes up uh, for what's called the Master License Agreement. Um, the concept of the Master License Agreement is perfectly reasonable and appropriate. However, there are specific terms that we have been unable to negotiate to a point where they're satisfactory to the city that are being insisted upon, and that has resulted in the city filing a lawsuit in Superior Court against both the railroad and uh, B-Trans to try to get some determination from the court whether or not these entities even have the authority to uh, require a license for us to use our own roads for utility, municipal utility, utility purposes. Um, historically, we worked very, very cooperatively and successfully with both the railroad and with V-Trans, and we look forward to doing that in the future. Unfortunately, we've run into this stumbling block. Um, since this is something that is being pursued everywhere, there is a similar project throughout the state. There's an enormous amount of infrastructure, water and sewer infrastructure work being done, and there'll be more in the future. This is something that should be brought to your attention, I believe. I do understand that Representative Fagan from the City of Belton will be reintroducing a bill that will address at least some of the concerns here, and I wouldn't be surprised if that bill came before you. Um, I'd love to come back and talk about the specifics of that whenever that happens, if it does. Finally, I'd just like to let you know what the terms are that we find offensive, and I'll just cite three. First of all, um, we would have to agree, and we've attempted for two years to negotiate acceptable terms. We haven't been able to do that. We would have to accept um, liability associated with any uh, losses, uh, loss of life, loss of business, loss of property, as a result of a, an event uh, at a crossing that was related to water or sewer infrastructure underneath that crossing. And we have to assume that responsibility even in the instance when the event is caused by the negligence of the railroad or its employees or B trains or its employees. And we object to that. The second one, which is not as significant, is uh, in the event that we sign this agreement and the railroad or B trains determine that we are not living up to the terms of the agreement, they could file a lawsuit and try to enforce the agreement, which is perfectly fine. Um, what is unacceptable is that even if the city prevails in the, as a result of that lawsuit, we still are responsible for the legal fees and costs associated with the railroad or the v trains bringing the lawsuit. We object to that. Finally, and from my personal perspective, perhaps my greatest objection, is with the requirement that the city would have to um, get permission from the Secretary of Transportation and the President of the Railroad before any future infrastructure projects, replacement, extension, upgrade, maintenance, anything at any railroad crossing within the city, um, un in, under this agreement, we'd have to get their permission to do that. And the agreement also states that we, by signing the agreement, waive all rights to challenge or appeal any adverse decision that the railroad or VTrans would make. As Commissioner of Public Works and the person most directly responsible for the integrity and the safety and the adequacy of our drinking water system and also environmental protection associated with our wastewater system and human health protection. It would be, I think, unforgivable for me to ever agree to give that kind of authority over the, the future disposition of those critical environmental and public health and safety infrastructures to entities that, quite frankly, have no interest and really could care less about whether or not that system is operating as it must and as it should. Um, we simply can never accept to accept that term. So it's in the courts. We'll see what the courts decide. Um, there's a bill coming. You may see that bill. But I wanted to at least allow you to know that this is an issue and it's an issue across the state. 
it is our understanding, although I haven't received the list, um, that at least a few dozen municipalities have already signed these agreements. And I can assure you that the city of Rockland alone, unless we're ordered to by court. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. My name is Bill Shepard, I'm the municipal manager in Waterbury, and I won't take much of your time this morning because I really can't add too much <coughs> so eloquently stated by colleagues and friends. Um, in keeping with uh, Commissioner Wentberg, I do want to acknowledge to the committee that uh, we appreciate so much of the work that has been done in our community over the past uh, seven or eight years in particular since, uh, since the flood. It, these are not flood-related projects. Uh, the state uh, was quite helpful in our recovery from the flood, but um, since since 2011, the state has rebuilt Route 2 from Waterloo to Bolton. Uh, last year uh, and the year before, um, have rebuilt Route 100 from Waterloo to Stowe. That we finished up this year. Um, traffic light improvements are uh, part of that project. Um, the, the roundabout, the right? interstate bridges, the roundabout, the roundabout is fabulous. It works tremendously and has saved many, many, many gallons of gasoline, uh, which we don't have to tax, but uh, because the money has been saved uh, by not sitting there at that at that intersection. Um, Main Street, our Main Street is going to be reconstructed uh, over the next three construction seasons. Uh, we hope that we'll still come to Waterway and, and patronize our businesses. But that's a project, you know, when I was hired in 1988, I interviewed for the job in Waterbury in uh, November of 1987. And the chairperson of the select board at the time, who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, told me that Main Street was going to be reconstructed in the early 1990s. And there's a cooperative agreement between Waterbury, the uh, Agency of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration that was signed in like 1992 that spelled out the, the funding formula for this project. Um, I've been in the town manager in Waterloo for 31 years now, and the project's going to start this April. So we've waited a long time for this project, um, but we do appreciate the fact that it's going to be done. Uh, VTrans um, is taking the lead on this project in terms of the oversight. They're doing a wonderful job. We have uh, nothing but good things to say about those folks. With regard to the particular issues that we're talking about today, um, we understand everybody has tight budgets. Um, I can't remember what I told the newspaper yesterday. I'll get the year wrong, but I, I believe it was 2009. Uh, Barbara's highway budget was about $980,000, and we were receiving $106,000 of uh, general state aid from the state. Not British money, not paid money, just the general state aid to the highways, $106,000. Uh, our highway budget is over $1.6 million now, and we're receiving $109,000 from the state for general highway aid. Uh, you know, the increase in the, you know, not that quick. I know our increase is about 60% over that time, and the general highway to, to the towns has gone up just uh, single digit percentage wise. Um, you know, much of our increase in our budget is catch up uh, work, so we now uh, set aside uh, 500. $35,000 a year from our highway budget, so included in that $1.6 million is $535,000 that's going into capital budgets that will pay for paving for bridges and culverts and for highway equipment. Uh, some years we spend much more than that uh, on all those three items, and some years we spend a little less than that. 
But it is safe to say that the general aid to highways is not keeping up at all with, with the cost of doing business or the cost of inflation. Um, Nick Nekaraz, my friend from Glover, um, I, I can't say it better than he did. If, if there's a time to raise a gas tax to provide more revenue to the state that can be shared to the municipalities, uh, what better time than now? Um, no one likes to pay taxes. No one likes to have to pay gas taxes or property taxes. We have raised the property tax in our community. Uh, it's, it's going up about 13% this year. And, and not all of that is transportation related. There's a lot of factors to that. Um, we tried hard over the, the years that we were recovering from the flood to keep the tax rate uh, as level as we could, um, just because the community had other things to, to spend their money on to recover. But at some point when you take your reserve money every year that's left over from your budget and use it, use it to um, keep taxes at, a, at a, a level rate, when those reserves are used up, well, you only have one place to go to get that additional money. So we're raising property taxes. Um, you know, I did a quick calculation, uh, and I tried to be very conservative. I said, you know, if uh, somebody in the Northeast Kingdom like Nick, who lives there, and maybe they have to travel a long distance to go to work, they travel 22,000 miles a year in, a, in an old pickup truck that gets 12 miles a gallon, you know, they're going to pay about $75 for a gas tax. And if that gas tax, that four cents, can be used and, and shared with municipalities to increase uh, our uh, general aid to highways from that other 9,000, maybe to 35,000 or 140,000. I mean, you know, the, the reporter asked me the other day, he said, well, you can't fix all your roads for $30,000 more of general state aid. I said, no, we can't. But if we, if we get that $30,000 more over the course of five or six years, you know, that's $150,000. And I've got a bridge in my budget this year that we're going to be doing major repairs to. It's not a rebuild of bridge, but it's major repairs to a bridge. That's a $138,000 project. So in that time, we can get another bridge repaired so we don't have to completely replace it, uh, you know, in, in five years. We can extend the life. So I, I think with gas prices where they are today, uh, uh, if you look at them in terms of real dollars, uh, I don't think we're spending any more for gasoline than we spent in the 1980s. Now. And um, uh, the, the folks who have talked about this issue have suggested that the best place to put it is into this general aid to highways, as opposed to putting it into a bridge grant program or a paving grant program. The, the, Town managers, the select board chairpersons, and the highway road commissioners, they know what needs to be done in their communities to address the needs that are important to their communities. Uh, I think there can be an easy way to, uh, to make sure that this money, if it is passed along from the state to the towns, isn't just used to reduce or lower or even stabilize property taxes. There's a simple way to I think we can all think about to come up with to say, you know, how did you use this money? I would not ask this money to be sent to the towns so that a town could spend the same as they did last year and just lower the taxes for it. Anyway, uh, the details of that can be worked out uh, at, at any time in the, in the, in the near future. I, I will just leave you with, with my thanks. Um, the one last thing on the consolidation of the of the district transportation offices. Uh, I still remember Jim Bassett, who was the district transportation officer up in the Northeast Kingdom when I was the manager of Island Pond uh, 35 years ago. Um, I remember him because I had a lot of interaction with him. I met with him. Uh, he helped us with our projects. I moved to Waterbury in the, in the late 80s, and there was a gentleman by the name of Lambert, who was the district engineer here in the, in the central Vermont area. Um, 
our district has been consolidated. Uh, there was a consolidation a, a couple of years ago, and now our district is in Colchester. And nothing against having a district office that's in Colchester, but uh, the more that you consolidate, uh, there, there are savings that can be had, I'm sure. But what you lose is the people in the districts are familiar with the issues that you're talking about. And if you, if you consolidate to the point that we heard about potentially this morning, three districts for the whole state, uh, having that on the ground knowledge of what's needed is, is going to be more difficult. So I would, I would caution against that. I, I, I don't know enough about it to say we don't know anything about it at this point. OK. Well, good. OK, thank you. I'm sorry if I brought it up. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, we still got time. There's six left, so we're going to try to run your coaching on this paper. Uh, Chet, don't you? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Chet Hagenbrook. I'm with the town of Tonkin uh, as the town manager, uh, formerly the director of highway facilities. And what I wanted to, to bring to the attention of this committee is uh, the idea of sustainability uh, from an infrastructure planning perspective. Uh, one of the things that I think how uh, the program is set up for funding uh, is basically looking at what they consider to be the most urgent project needs, uh, which projects have the biggest problem and we fund that amount of money per year. <clears throat> However, if you look at the, at the program that the AOT has, it, it, it actually outlines what the replacement plan should be for their roads. It's an eight to 12 year cycle for all state roads uh, with a 40 year reconstruct program. Um, we're not anywhere near that as a state. I mean, we're not even in, in the big ballpark. And, and the thing that happens when you, when you allow that type of funding mechanism to go forward is the projects get more involved, way more expensive, and you create, you're creating uh, an end game that's going to be very ugly because uh, we're going to get to a point where we can't fund. Um, we have developed a, a sustainable funding program for capital. Uh, I think you'd, you'd find it very surprising if, if the state were to undertake that type of a process to determine what should we be funding. If we were going to do this correctly, what should the funding level be for state infrastructure? And and once the program is in place, because we, we haven't have set up with inflation factors and things of that nature, if you if you delay a project one year and you take that funding out for that year, five years out the whole program goes negative. It's not it, I I was very surprised at how quickly things fall apart, and, it, and it's an exponential loss of value and, and an area where you can't catch up. Um, so what I wanted to hopefully impart to you was to really start to look at what we need to be doing for infrastructure funding. Um, while we have a gas tax, only a portion of it actually goes to highways. So I echo the sentiments of, of many of the prior speakers in that we need to take a higher percentage of that gas tax. I mean, technically, if I could have it my way, it should all go to infrastructure spending because that's what it's for, is to replace the people are paying the tax for using the roads and deteriorating the roads. And then on top of that, you know, an increase in the gas tax, I, you know, I'm not, nobody wants to have a new tax, I'm not opposed to the concept as long as the money's actually gonna to go to infrastructure and highway funding. I mean, if we're gonna allow this just to go into the general fund, and start funding other projects because it's what's happened with the funding related to, to stormwater treatment. Uh, that money has now been funneled from paving and projects in the infrastructure world to stormwater. So we're taking more, pro we're taking more programs out of the same funding pot. And I think we have to look at not, not going to dip into that pot anymore because it's, it's pretty close to dry as, as far as I can tell. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Jameson Davis on Tiger. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. All right. Good morning, everybody. You got a chair in there. You got a big book here. <laughs> I do, right? I'm not going to the whole thing. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it, though. Uh, respect the members of the, of the committee. Thank you for having me today. So, um, I'm here today, I just want to first acknowledge that uh, like my peers and my colleagues that came before me, I also share the love of my community. 
Um, I love my town, the town of Hartford, and uh, just what it's done and, and, and has provided for me. Hence the reason that I'm not in uh, property law right now, because I should be. Um, uh, and I missed contract law class this morning as well. So hopefully the cameras won't give me too much trouble. Um, but that, that's out the way. So the town of Hartford, for those who may not know, um, from my belief, I could be wrong, but my belief we have the highest uh, miles of paved road at 140 miles, um, which is enormous. Uh, 10 miles of those, we have also, excuse me, we also have 10 miles of the sidewalk as well. So when we speak as a select board of uh, doing infrastructure work or doing any type of work with the roads, no matter what the project is, it usually turns out to be a hefty sum of money. So everything that happens in this committee um, and decisions that are made in this room uh, have a very specific impact on our community. And so I just want to take time to thank you for the work that you do. Uh, we have dealt with you guys quite frequently. Um, just in my short time of being on the select board in the town of Hartford, uh, we've had um, the Creechy Main Street culvert work being done. Uh, we've had uh, Route 5. Uh, we just got a notice about a right away that's been uh, in stages for, I think, over 10 years. Um, the Hartford Village Bridge is something that we are going to be getting a presentation on very soon. And you guys did excellent work at the Creechy Gorge Bridge as well, which is, uh, we are still uh, appreciative of that and, and getting some positive feedback from our citizens about the work there. So I know of the work that can be done in this room, um, great work that can be done in this room. So with that said, um, there are a couple things I want to say and, just, and leave you with some food for thought on my way out. So lack of accessible, accessible transportation is huge. And what that does, that leads to uh, missed health care appointments, um, leads to social isolation of our elder population. And that's something that we do not want to happen. Monetary assistance is needed from the state, and it's critical. But the town's ability to offer safe, uh, affordable, and efficient transportation uh, we need this money in order to provide choices for people. The increase in pedestrian, uh, bicyclists, and disabilities um, also play a major factor in this. And we would like to keep all of our citizens, especially those with disabilities and those who need accessible transportation um, at the front of our minds to make sure that they have the adequate uh, resources they need to get to the places that will help them and their health. So my, I have a couple questions to kind of give you guys just proof, proof of thought. So my question to you is, what does sustainable transportation in a rural area look like? What does that actually look like on paper? What can that, how can that be emphasized over time? The second thing is, with the state's goal of reduction of fossil fuels and the consumption of fossil fuels, in regards to the gas tax, is the state preparing uh, a way to meet the needs of infrastructure um, with the increase of sustainable uh, energy in terms of vehicles? So obviously with electric vehicles and vehicles of those nature becoming um, more accessible and um, more used on a regular basis, that will obviously lower the amount that the tax revenue is going to generate. And so at some point, there's going to have to be a give and take in terms of when that tax revenue is kind of hit its ceiling or when you kind of squeeze the last dollar out of it in terms of comparing that money that we, that we could have brought in um, now not being there because the increase of electric cars and other sustainable vehicles um, will be in, in the same uh, transportation sphere. So in closing, thank you for your time. Just want to ask for additional funds for the roads, additional funds for accessible transportation, and the funds that we do get from the tax, uh, the gas tax right now, will go more towards infrastructure, transportation, and land.
less towards the general funds overall. So thank you for your time and greatly appreciate all that you do. Thank, thank you. Clarification. Yes, sir. Price, uh, accessible transportation in the transit. Yeah, uh, yes, transit. Um, I, I also am specifically speaking about uh, transportation that allows uh, accessibility in terms of um, uh, disabilities um, and finding a way to maybe have some type of public transportation that allows um, those who, are, who have disabilities to have an easier time getting around. For research that I did prior to being here today, 69% uh, of elderly people have at some point, one way or another, either had to reschedule or miss their appointments overall because they don't have the simple needs of transportation. Um, they usually rely and lend on their family members, and not all the time is that is that something that could be uh, adequate. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Stuart Rogers. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, my name is Stuart Rogers. I'm the current select board chair for the town of Denver. Um, I would like to uh, reiterate or, or follow up on concerns of cost for infrastructure. Um, we currently, um, on the western side of our town, uh, is Route 132, which is one of the very few state designated highways that is not maintained by the state. Um, in the, in, on the eastern end, it starts in Norwich, goes through Thetford, uh, Stratford, and Sharon, and the four towns um, of their respective sections maintain that road. Um, it's a cost in that infrastructure of those upgrades and that paving that um, realistically each of us can cannot afford to do. Um, conversations that I've had with VTrans, uh, one of the concerns that they have in this is um, they don't have a facility close enough to be able to maintain it, um, such as plowing, etc. Um, I would offer a thought of a hybrid approach that if the state could take over that route so that it is, um, as far as upgrading and paving, that the town can maintain any of the, the plowing and roadside mowing. We have, we currently have the facility, we have the equipment, we have the personnel to do that. We don't have the funds and, and the ability to be able to upgrade and pave that road. And it's been, um, at the best points in areas, it's been um, shimmed and top-coated, but that's, that's become just a very expensive band-aid approach. And um, we have, um, you know, Thetford has 87 miles of town roads, so our costs are um, spread wide over all of that. Um, but this is a roadway that's also listed as a major collector. It's also listed as a FEMA evacuation road. Um, so that that would be a cost that would be helpful if the state could consider at that point. And again, it would be um, it would be an interesting discussion to have if we could do so with a hybrid approach. Have the towns plow up as we have been. Do the roadside mowing. We just cannot do the other aspects of it. Um, as an added note, um, yes, uh, VTRAN has been um, very helpful, especially District Four and work that we have been doing in town. Um, they've been a big help in what we went through in the process of rebuilding from the July 1st, 2017 storm, of which we incurred over four and a half million dollars damage to um, our town roads, roads that did not exist after that. And they've been a great help, and we'd like to uh, say appreciation for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, Charles Stafford. Um, so, got so many skiers this year, you're probably going to come to give us money back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, I'll it to it over to it. Okay. Well, that's a good way to start off. Thanks uh, for having me. Uh, you're all welcome to snow. The snow, the snow is great. Uh, uh, I, I really want to thank uh, you folks uh, uh, for your. Uh, we've had so much. Challenge in the snow, one was getting up the mountain road, and last year the state stepped up and paved the mountain road. We received a lot of complaints about its conditions. Uh, 
and, uh, and uh, this year, uh, Green Mountain Transit was talking about pulling our public transit and our service uh, that uh, goes from uh, the downtown to the, the hotels and up and down the mountain road to, uh, so we don't have to build as many parking lots and uh, um, widen our roads and continue to do so. And uh, B-Trans uh, very effectively worked with us to step in and ensure that didn't happen. So. Uh, that's very much appreciated, and we've had some uh, great partnerships uh, with VTrans. I think uh, Joe Flynn and his team are uh, doing a good job. Um, with that being said, you know, I often reflect, uh, and I try not to be passive aggressive, so I'll tell you uh, some broader thoughts. You know, my father always told me that perspective was a function of position. Where you sit is where you stand. And I had an interface with the legislature last year, and she was pretty dismissive. She said, all oh, you folks do it, the LCT is come and beg for money. And I think said, uh, I, I was silent, and I, I've tried to, you know, learn not to do that, uh, uh, sometimes for better or worse. You know, but the reality is, is uh, we're not a home rule state for self-governance. We don't have the ability to raise revenues other than what you allow. We're essentially left with a property tax. And, uh, you know, that is a stretch very thin and it's uh, very burdensome to folks. And uh, you know, when we started to hear about cuts to aid to municipalities, um, you know, that's troublesome. Um, as folks said, we're where the rubber meets the road. And uh, we have a lot of them to take care of. And we depend on you folks. You have broad-based taxing authority, you get federal aid, um, the gas tax, and we're dependent on you to redistribute that and or allow us to have more taxing authority locally so we can pick up some of that load on our own. And, but that's the reality. We're not beggars, we're partners. And we can work effectively together. Um, you know, and sometimes I still see glimmers of the state, uh, and I can see in tight budget times how that could occur, uh, about the state budget. We brought the state budget in online, and, and uh, my agency, you folks have a much heavier burden than we do. You have to look at the whole state. More subdivisions in that state. And we're part of that equation. So I encourage you as the People's House to keep looking along those lines. And I have great confidence when I hear someone from Irisburg here uh, that uh, they can't help but be connected with folks and, and where it matters. And uh, I would encourage that uh, to continue to occur. And you know, Bill mentioned a little bit, and it hasn't come to your play about the district transportation administrators, and you know, you talk about efficiencies, and everyone's trying to stretch a dollar. I get that. I remember over 30 years ago when I started as a hardware town manager, and uh, I knew the district transportation administrator, and I remember his name to this day. It was Dick Hodgson. I had someone come up, I think, from St. Albans, the last place he shoveled us, and I welcomed him to Stowe and tried to show him around so he could see the lay of the land. But he acknowledged he stretched so thin. I don't know if he's ever been there. I told him he's welcome to come back skiing. Uh, no fault of his own. So, you know, Vermont re relies on its connectivity. And they do have a role in municipalities. And we can't make their reach so broad that uh, people uh, aren't able to know each other and, uh, and the issues uh, that they're uh, need to interface on. With that being said, I thank you for your time. I appreciate your, your good work on behalf of the people of the state. Thank you. appreciate it. Just a couple of things for clarification. Uh, that's right. In general, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, I've heard some remarks about the money going to the general fund. Well, we're, we're one of the few states that has a transportation fund and a general fund separated, so we do protect our transportation fund. The second thing is the federal government has not been very active in producing a bill, so we're getting very small increases as we stand here today. They have to raise the gas tax since 1993. Just think of that on the national level. So we're waiting for some sort of incentive from the federal government to, you know, help us out a little more so we can pass on a little more. One of the last things we want to do, I think, is hurt the towns. That's why, so far, we haven't had a complete discussion with the agency, but we have protected your programs, uh, downtown highway A, structures, class two highways, generally. So those are protected, but we will have a discussion with the agency uh, about the other, uh, the stormwater debate that we haven't had yet. So 
that's all for discussion. So with that, let's go ahead. So I think we'll be that for some else. No, just to thank everyone for coming. I thought the testimony was just excellent, and extremely informative. And I'm going to try to grab four or five of you before we leave the room right now. So thank you very much for coming.